Welcome everyone to my annual 20, well, my annual housing forecast. I'm Kathy Fedke, co-CEO and co-founder of Real Wealth. And, uh, you know, every year I've been doing this forecast, kind of borrowing work from um, actual economists. And this year I thought, well, wouldn't it be better if I just invited uh, somebody who can really speak to this topic? And that would certainly be Logan Motoshami from, uh, well, he is currently the lead data analyst at Housing Wire. Gives a lot of great information on Instagram. If you don't follow him, you will want to. I watch it every day. Um, and he was so kind as to offer to be here, which I think is is rare um, to be doing a webinar outside of Housing Wire. So Logan, we're so, so happy to have you here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, you know, you are, I've had a lot of really negative Nancy's, <laughs> I'll just say naysayers on the show. I've had people predicting all kinds of things. Um, I've had Peter Schiff on, Harry Dent. So when I got to hear, interview you on the Real Wealth Show, I think it was in May, it was so refreshing because you're so positive. Now, have you ever made negative predictions? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, with economic models, I've always talked about, you know, you you have to have an economic expansionary model and an economic recession model. And what had happened was we had the longest economic and job expansion ever recorded in history. And then COVID was this exogenistic shock. But on April 7th on 2020 for Housing Wire, I wrote a America's Back Recovery Model, gave people dates, certain data lines to follow. For the recovery was supposed to be coming in 2020, not you know four or five years uh, out. So because we've become kind of almost like a professional grifting society on the internet, mm -hmm. um, Doomsday sells a lot uh, better than boring economic work. I would say economics done right should be very boring. You always want to be the detective, not the troll. So naturally, in 2020, there was a lot of what we call the housing bubble boys. People who are, talk about housing crashing every year. And they thought COVID was their savior. They thought, that's it, nobody's gonna buy a home. Well, the recovery happens so fast and that the goalpost gets moved to the next year. And that's what typically happens. And hence, knowing this would be the case, I created the term forbearance crash bros in the summer of 2020, just to highlight that they're gonna talk about forbearance all the way in 2021. It's not gonna be the crash. You have to worry about home prices accelerating, not crashing. So. For me, it's all about economic models, and I always say, if you don't, if you don't, don't listen to people with economic models. Be kind of suspect, especially if their record is always doom and gloom uh, all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I asked you to bring some slides to support this when we did the Real Wealth Show. You know, it's audio, of course, so we didn't have that, but today we do, and I'm so excited about that. So, of course, disclaimer. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure Logan does have a crystal ball because he's been really accurate, but still. Always consult with your uh, personal advisors, accountants, CPAs, attorneys, whatever you need to do to make the financial decisions uh, you need to make. We're just helping you along the way, giving you some data to make up your own decisions. That was my version of the disclaimer. <laughs> okay, so about Logan, he's the lead analyst, as I said, for Housing Wire, financial writer, blogger, covering the US economy, specializing in, ha um, in housing. I have never, I have a lot of people I follow and it's been great. I just love what you have to say. Of course, it benefits those of us who, who own real estate. So of course I like what you have to say. I, I, I'd still have you on though, if you said that everything was gonna crash, cause I wanna know, right? We wanna know what's coming. Unfortunately, it sounds like maybe that's not it. And I love this line, now retired, Logan spends his days and nights looking at charts and nothing else except for art. I've seen you looking yes, at some art. That's for sure, I do have art, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on Instagram, it's charts and art. <laughs> yeah, arts and arts. All right. So we're gonna just first do, uh, I, some of these slides are the ones you gave me, some are ones that I grabbed. We'll just uh, take a look at them. So let's let's start with job openings and talking about the economy overall. Crazy, lots of job openings still. Yes, and this has actually been very common from our work in the previous expansion. The previous expansion, I talked about job openings where you get to about 6.21 million. And then, you know, uh, in, in years 2020 to 2024, it's different. A lot of my work is, is broken off into two groups, 2008 to 2019, and then 2020 to 2024 is going to be different. So while the recovery was happening, I think I was the only person in America, which means probably the only person in the world, that was tweeting out jolts 10 million, which is the job openings term 
on, on uh, Twitter finance. So job openings getting this large looks perfectly normal to me because naturally the demographic backdrop of this country is much different. Uh, the baby boomers are retiring every year. Uh, no country has a Dorian Gray labor market force. So basically aging and death are very potent forces of the economy. And if you look at the trend of uh, job openings, we had 7 million job openings before COVID hit. And then there's been some natural retirement. I mean, I, I'm the odd one. I'm under 65, so I retired, so I'm no longer working. But a lot of people are in their late 60s and 70s. They leave the workforce. And there's parts of the United States of America that don't really have much prime age labor force growth. So job openings getting to 10 million plus was a big call of mine, and it looks normal, right? I think there's a lot of other things that people think were holding uh, people back from working. Not really much so. Aging and death are always powerful forces of the economy. It's never changed from that uh, in the history of economics. So is is what you're saying that if, if COVID had not happened, we might still be here? It, we, would this probably, we would get to 10 million job openings, probably not as fast. Uh, there are some early retirements. I mean, COVID-19 has did some really disjointed things to economic data uh, on a historical fashion that I'll probably never see again. So for myself, we always do uh, what I call COVID-19 COVID adjustments to the data line. But the trend is your friend. The trend is always your friend. And job openings were heading toward this way uh, anyhow. Because the U.S. economy, actually what not a lot of people uh, remember, authentically actually broke out the first two months of uh, uh, 2020. January and February economic data was really good. Housing authentically broke out for the first time in 15 years in February of 2020. We got that data in March like March 15th and toward the end of March. So we're dealing with the chaos of COVID. So everyone forgot about that. And it's been a while since the, all the data lines, authentic new home sales, purchase application data, existing home sales, home prices were already up at 8%. That just doesn't go away because of a, 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 of a health crisis. Those people are still there and they're still gonna buy a home. So we had a pause uh, in buying, purchase application data fell, we didn't, we had a V-shaped recovery and then that's it. The game's on because years 2020 to 2024 are different than what we saw from 2008 to 2019. Demographics right now currently are the best ever recorded in U.S. history and mortgage rates are near all-time lows. Don't make it any more complicated than that. People <laughs> need shelter, right? Okay, yeah. people buy homes. No, nobody else, not Wall Street or anything else. People need shelter. That's all it is. We have the biggest home, the biggest demographic patch right now, ages 28 to 34. <clears throat> Guess what? They need somewhere to live. If they're not buying homes, they're renting. Home prices accelerated. Rent inflation is accelerated. That, that, that looks perfectly normal when you have this unique demographic patch. And uh, and there was so much concern that jobs weren't coming back and you kept telling the world, no, they're coming back. They're coming back and look at this chart, jobless claims way down and kind of- Yeah, I mean, that talk about a parabolic chart and a waterfall fall. So for me, with the America's Back Recovery Model on April 7th, 2020, I said, I gave dates for people. May 18th, June 15th was another one for housing and then September 1st. So we had this parabolic spike because everyone froze, right? We all kind of froze as a country. Um, this is a one-time event in the sense that COVID can't scare us anymore. Uh, the behavior of how we uh, acted on surges two, three, four, five, and now six, it doesn't have the same kind of impact. We were working from the longest economic and job expansion in history, then all of a sudden, hey, guess what? We have a virus infecting and killing people. So we froze and it took about six weeks for us to kind of like, okay, we're still alive. Right. And we in the jobs were going to come back. Right. Because there was nothing wrong with the economy. I think a lot of people, the mistake I saw in 2020 is that people thought we were going into a recession uh, toward the end of 2019. The economic data got better. 20, January and February was good. And then when, when things started to get back, when people started to spend and live their lives again, the jobs came back in a very fast fashion. You could see it in jobless claims data. And it's just a waterfall collapse. And currently right now we just hit a level that hasn't been seen since 1969. And that looks perfectly normal because we were in that area right before COVID hit as well. Now, I don't have the quits rate on here, but that's been in the news a lot. Um, tell, what, what does that mean? Well, people are quitting their jobs for better paying jobs, right? It's not the quit ratio. Some people think, well, people are quitting and, and, and not working. No, uh, typically wage growth is really happening on the lower end. So I kind of have a hashtag on uh, Twitter, a tighter labor market is always a good thing or it's a good thing always um what happens is that 
when you have a tighter labor market, people offer you more. Uh, Amazon is offering a lot better wages than a lot of uh, companies. So naturally people will quit and go do a job that pays well. So it is a, uh, it is a very effective measure in terms of when you see wage growth, especially on the bottom end, picks up that quits uh, happen on that end as well, just because the high turnover ratio. It's a positive, you know, wages are going up uh, on the lower end. Uh, one thing about that is that rental inflation is going to pick up and, and, and it has. And that's another theme of mine in the summer of 2020. Say, hey, listen, cities aren't dying. Uh, people are going to come back. They're going to rent. So rent inflation will follow uh, what home prices are because, again, Massive amount of people need shelter. Don't make it any more complicated than that. So the quit ratio is actually, if you're looking for landlords, they have a little bit more uh, pricing power to charge more rent as wages grow on the bottom. Interesting. Personal savings rate, it really went up and now kind of leveling off again? Yeah, you know, um, personal savings rate always has these little one-time moves off of historic events like the Microsoft dividend or, you know, ta tax selling uh, in, in stocks to kind of get ahead of any kind of tax bill. And then it kind of uh, flows back down. So I think the stock of the savings is actually very healthy. The rate had gone up because of the checks that were uh, initiated. You, if you tag this chart to the uh, transfer payments that had come in these one-time checks, you see this big move up and then it comes right back down. It actually looks perfectly normal just because the scale of the disaster relief uh, uh, during this event was so massive and it comes right back down. But again, people are spending, retail sales are good, home sales are good, Americans have jobs, wages, and they're spending out now. Well, yes. so one might question if, if people got all this extra money and they obviously spent it because the savings isn't there anymore, um, is that what fueled the retail sales and will that continue? This is a debate that a lot of people are having that, you know, um, and, and for me personally, again, years 2020 to 2024 was, for me is going to be different because it's what we call household formation spending. You know, people buying homes. When you buy homes and you have kids, you spend differently than somebody in their 60s or 70s. So, um, I, I always debate with myself, is a lot of this the household formation spending or is it all just the disaster relief? I think it's a little bit of both because durable goods spending uh, took off in a really big fashion. And I had expected this data to moderate by now and it hasn't. Uh, so uh, the rate of growth can't be sustained uh, from what we saw earlier last year, but it should be stable. It's actually really rare to have retail sales go negative uh, the, in the great financial uh, recession we did briefly and then the kind of one month of COVID, but uh, people spend every day and, and that trend line that we've seen in retail sales pretty much stays the course. Uh, job loss recession could slow that down, but what we saw in retail sales is complete deviation off the charts, but again, moderation. Things will always go back to a more sustainable trend and this data should moderate, but the fact that it hasn't is, has made me pause. I think there's a little bit more going on here than just the uh, one-time boost in uh, savings rate and income. Interesting. Okay, so let's talk about the um, health of the, and I do mean financial health, actually, of the of today's homeowner. Again, there's there's so many people, not just the crash bros, <laughs> but the but just the regular Joes, the people going. I don't want to go through this 2008 thing again. I don't want to do that. Um, people are, you know, I, I hear all kinds of things. They're taking crazy loans. They're not putting down payments. They're doing cash out refis, all this stuff. But let's really look at the reality of it, starting with mortgage debt service payments. Tell me about so, this slide. So unfortunately, the worst talented Americans that we had were also housing crash addicts. And this is... <laughs> A grift for 10 years. We call them the housing bubble boys, and I call them the lost decade. And what had happened was just a short eight hour course of credit profile uh, uh, training could have told you that the homeowners post 2010, and this has been a big thing of my work for, for a long time fixed, long, low uh, debt cost and rising wages. Housing tenure is well over 10 years now. People buy a house, their wages increase every year. When they refinance, right, their cash flow looks better. So naturally what has occurred is this historic event, homeowners on paper and on record have never looked better in the history of the United States of America and their payments, their debt service payments as a percentage of disposable income, all time lows. It's the same with household debt payments because the majority of all consumer debt is, uh, uh, is mortgage debt, 
but there's no exotic loan debt structures past 2010. And that was the mistake a lot of housing bears made and it started in 2018 and 2019 and the marketing really took in in 2020 and 2021. This is a historical whiff because the homeowner in America has that advantage. They have a fixed low debt cost or wages, their wages in, uh, increase over time. And then we just had this mega refinancing, uh, a two year boom over 14 million uh, households have refinanced. So the stock of homes in America have never looked better. And about 40% of all homes in America don't have a mortgage either. So uh, it's never gonna look this good ever unless mortgage rates go below 2%. Well, it's interesting, right before we started the webinar, I said, you know, it's a scary time. My my daughter and her, her husband, they have had a baby. I've got the cutest brown baby in the world, I think. And, uh, you know, they, they've been renting and waiting for prices to go down. <laughs> and after you were on in, in May, I sent them the podcast and said, don't, you know, don't get too excited for home prices to go down. We're in Southern California. Uh, and sure enough, <laughs> they've gone up. So she yeah. did finally find a house. I, I worked some magic with the realtor. We, we, we got the winning bid with multiple, multiple offers, but of course it was over asking price, probably about $300,000 over what it would have been she done it a year or two ago um and and i said it's scary logan it, did she do the right thing and then you said it's all about the payment yes so. housing is the cost of shelter to your own capacity to own the debt it's not an investment it's a shelter cost so people react to what their payment levels are and i i, I honestly believe this i don't believe in the myth that there's millions and millions of americans that are really sitting there on the sidelines it's waiting for home prices to crash. If you look at trend sales, there hasn't been, the only event that ever caused a pause was COVID and that was for six weeks and right back up because people need somewhere to live. And typically homeowners, not typically, usually all the, all the time, uh, average homeowner makes over $100,000. They have the financials, they're looking at a payment and they're looking at rent, right? So it, it, it's almost that simple for the majority. It's just, just buying a payment. So the notion, I, I just, I'm not a big believer that millions and millions of people since 2012 have said, I'm just going to wait, I'm just going to wait, I'm just going to wait. <laughs> Clearly that's now, not the case, right? yeah. So it's just, it's just that it shouldn't shock people that when you have the best demographics ever recorded in history and you have the lowest mortgage rates, people buy homes. People, millions and that's what I've been saying. I didn't, probably our audience has heard this, heard me say this many times, but she's 29 years old. She's in the largest demographic group. So just like it was super hard for her to be an all-star soccer player because she had more competition than the others, just like it was harder for her to get into colleges because there was so much competition that is now play, at play with home with home buying. And, yeah. and literally there was one house available. There was yeah. one and we got it. I, I'll tell you guys my secrets if you ever wanna know how we won that bid, but uh, what well, we did. <laughs> yes, and, and later on with one of the other slides, I'll really go into the kind of long-term story about this, why I was worried about this very thing in years 2020 to 2024. Yeah, it's basically like, like I say, the hungry, hungry hippo game of the 1980s. Everybody's, you know, everybody's trying to go for those balls there's only one ball for the hippo to eat so it's just a hunger game right it's just yeah. uh literally inventory has collapsed to all-time lows last year and we're starting 2020 at all-time lows again so i think we got a slide for that but um before we do that mortgage originations by credit score this is fascinating i i love this slide i, I mean it's definitely difficult for people who don't have high high ficos but tell me about this slide so basically, one of my things that I've talked about in the last decade is that we have still very liberal lending standards, but we lend to the capacity to own a debt. So the FICO scores, you know, in the previous expansion should get better over time. Uh, um, there's a lot of housing bears who say, oh, this, this data line is not true. It's FICO score inflation. No, household debt payments are at all time lows. Uh, Americans who own homes have the best financials ever in our history. So they're okay. So naturally what happens is that the refinance boom we saw in 2020 and 2021 created better cash flow, right? So naturally your FICO score gets better. Uh, as you can see here, uh, it, it, this is a secondary importance, but uh, the first importance is that debt structures are very vanilla. So all these people just have a fixed low debt cost. And then the wave of refinancing just made their cash flow better. So I think they freed up about $40 billion of extra uh, spending and what, what that means is that you have better cash flow, you have better FICO score, 
right? And there's there's no exotic loan debts to turn this away. So you're you're living in the best time right now, and we see this in all housing homeowner data. Uh, and it shouldn't be a shock that FICO scores look this good. It's been here for many years. It just only really got attention now that it, it's so glaringly obvious how wrong the housing bears have been. And this is another uh, factor. Here. You just you just smile every time you say that. You just love being right. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding, but it, it's good to be right, especially when you know we're we're trying to make big decisions, right? These are really yes. big decisions. No one wants to spend three hundred thousand dollars more in a house than they would have last year just to find out that it's worth three hundred thousand dollars less next year. So you know these are scary decisions, especially as investors. They're buying a lot of homes. Yes, and this chart here is like to me the the mother chart of all time for housing. Um, Everyone, the, the token grifting line, it's 2008 all over again. It's 2008, it's 2008. This shows you how fraudulent these people are. It actually didn't start in 2008, right? Uh, the housing cycle that we saw from 2002 to 2005 was a credit bubble. We saw a, a big expansion of leverage and credit and there were exotic loan debt structures, okay? So that was building up. If you look at it uh, in 2005, the, the previous years, bankruptcies really started going off. There was a 2005 bankruptcy law reform that happened. Okay, so one level of the consumer was going to be fine going out. Then what happened is that home sales peaked in 2005. Then they started to decline noticeably because we had a credit boom, right? All bubbles or all facilitation uh, uh, of speculation is usually done by credit or leverage. And so what happened was that bankruptcies were rising, foreclosures were rising in 2005, six, seven, eight. Then the job loss recession happened on top of that, okay? None of that is happening currently. So the people that kept on telling you the housing bubble voice for 10 years, we're going to crash, we're going to crash. There was no data to verify any of this because it was actually the weakest recovery ever. And then the delinquencies and the foreclosures were going down. So naturally, oh, well, COVID, it has to happen. Now people are just going to foreclose. And no, you have so much nested equities, homeowners were fine. And the thing, the historical thing is that forbearance itself was near 5 million. At the start of it, which was the which wasn't even bigger than the shadow inventory in 2012, it is under 882,000. The only housing data that collapsed during this uh, two-year period was forbearance itself. So not only did they get it epically wrong, the one thing that did collapse was forbearance, and because the quality of homeowners post 2010, will I mean, and and I say this as somebody whose family's been in banking since the late 1950s, it will never look this good. Uh, ever again. It was these people are in their homes longer, their cash flow is better, there's no exotic loan debt, and you see this in the delinquencies and foreclosures. And and we ran into this crisis with better balance sheets, better homeowners, so it shouldn't be a shock that we never saw the forbearance crash bros win. And there are people who look at this chart and are frustrated. Obviously, it's great that people aren't filing bankruptcies or, or foreclosures. Uh, but for people who are looking for foreclosures, people who used to get their their deals that way, um, keep waiting. And yeah. a lot of our members keep uh, let, me, let, me, let me apologize for all the bad takes uh, that some of these people have been listening to. It really started in 2018 where the marketing of housing crashing took off and there was real estate investors that were pushing crashes. It was never going to happen, right? And this smile was, I knew it was never going to happen. I even coined the phrase forbearance crash bros because I knew these guys will keep on doing the same thing. Yeah, forbearance, yeah. forbearance. It's these clicked. are not trained data people, right? Yeah. Uh, like I always said, always be the detective, not the troll. These people were trolling. They got it wrong. So let me apologize for them. They gave you really bad advice. None of this happened. Uh, America won. Tough luck. America won. That's, that's, that's the theme here. But we do have, you know, 15 property teams nationwide who used to be able to go to these auctions, buy homes really cheap, fix them up and sell them to our members. And our members are saying, where are they? You know, when the foreclosure moratorium ends, will there suddenly be more foreclosures? And there, we, we think there's a yeah, there's gonna, yeah, there's gonna be there's gonna be actually some pickup just because there's actually some vacant homes that are still in the process, right? Uh, so initially, I always tell people you're gonna see a boost. There's gonna be like these really big percentages of foreclosures coming on the market. Some of these are vacant homes that have been there in the process from uh, 2017 and 18. So just remember that there's always gonna be homes that will will be in the marketplace. It's just not gonna be the 2008 
uh, 9, 10, and 11 foreclosure uh, supply increase. That, that's just not going to happen. So uh, look for where, you know, there have been older foreclosures that have been tied in the process since 2017, 18, they'll come onto the market. And, and not everyone's going to get out of, uh, of, of forbearance perfectly clean. So there should be some supply, but the notion that we were going to have an escalation of inventory like we saw there, it's not a very good call. It's not a very sophisticated call either. Yeah, okay. And total household debt balance, how's that looking? This is, you know, this is this is one of my favorite charts because I always tell people, not only is not only are 40% of all the homes in America have no mortgage debt, if you adjust it to inflation, mortgage debt is negative from the housing bubble uh, peak. And part of my work in the previous expansion was telling people, listen, we're gonna have the weakest housing recovery ever from 2008 to 2019. And what I mean by weakest recovery is that new home sales, uh, housing starts, uh, for, for example, one of my calls was housing starts were never going to start a year at 1.5 million until years 2020 to 2024. 2022 is the first year we've actually done that. So that looks normal. Purchase application data, the chart I'll show later, will never hit 300 because mortgage debt expansion is going to be very light and soft. Millions and millions of people buy homes every year uh, with a mortgage. But what happened was 2002 to 2005 was an anomaly right? It was a credit leverage. We're never going to see that again because lending is never going to allow that to happen. So the debt expansion is very soft, right? So there's no real big credit boom here. And then the stock of homes, the homeowners, the majority of homeowners that do have a mortgage, they've never looked better. So you never had a credit boom. You never had a housing boom from 2008 to 2019 in terms of expansion uh, uh, of debt. So it shouldn't be shocking that we're at these levels today and forbearance has fallen and homeowners look so good. Yeah. And your favorite slide. Yes. If I could tattoo this on my neck, I would, but uh, <laughs> do it, do it. Yeah. economics is demographics and productivity. Uh, housing economics is really driven by demographics and it is uh, uh, mortgage rates. So the notion, right? In the, the summer of 2020, I wrote an article on my blog saying uh, demographics crushed the housing bears. And in that article, I, 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 besides the fact that I was getting tomatoes thrown at me every, every day because I said we're recovering in 2020, I said existing home sales are going to be positive this year. And everyone really just said, now you're really crazy. I said, nope, the front-loaded purchase application data is back online. We're going to be positive. You can't have the biggest housing demographic patch and then the lowest mortgage rates and think to say the word crash. There is no, but like in the 1500s, you have to dispatch horses to get information. Maybe two years from now, you get that information. We have something called the internet, the census data. It was there for decades. There's nothing wrong with what housing look like, looks like today. You just have to be able to read. Reading is a good thing. It was always there. Millions and millions of people bought home. We just have the most ever in history. So this is why demographics crushed the housing bears because they didn't bother to read because it was always here. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not a sales boom or a credit boom person. I probably have the least uh, uh, amount of sales forecast out of anyone, but we have great replacement buyers. That's the term I use, because I thought that would you know, maybe translate to people that every year, young people have to buy homes. There's people who move up, move down, then there's cash and investors. You put them all together, demand will be stable, because it's the best demographic patch ever recorded in history. And it's also the lowest mortgage rates ever recorded in history. Don't overcomplicate it. It's that simple. It's that simple. Uh, so what what is the most? What are we looking at here? Um, well, right now this is uh, from 2020, but ages 28 to 34 right now are the biggest uh, in history. First time meeting home buyer is 33. Millennials have been starting to buy homes since starting in 2013. As a percentage of home buying, they're the biggest in America. So. That looks perfectly normal on the trend with everything else. It's just people, again, the same line I use every, like the last eight, nine years at conference, people rent, they date, they mate, they get married. Three and a half years after marriage, typically have a kid. People don't live in apartments all the time. They buy a home, uh, they make the money, that's it. It's as simple as boring as that. We are very predictable as human beings, especially as Americans. Nothing has changed. It's just that this year's 2020 to 2024 was a once in a lifetime unique period. Uh, I had a demographer on uh, the Real Wealth Show. He 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 was great. Um, and one of the things he said that was kind of the theme that we're bringing up today is that America is really in a good a good position in demographics compared to other 
like Europe and Japan and China. Uh, thoughts on Unbelievably that? Unbelievably well. In fact, one of my one of my most favorite charts I always put on Twitter is to show that our, our prime age uh, employment or labor force uh, uh, is going to be growing for decades because the millennials and Gen Z are massive. You put them two together, they're bigger than the total population of Japan. Uh, China doesn't have this, Japan doesn't have this, and Europe doesn't have this. I, I call these people replacement workers and replacement consumers, right? So the, the, the strength of the United States of America is its demographics. Not that population growth is growing, uh, the rate of growth is falling for, for, for a while now, but we have replacement buyers and consumers and workers. So naturally, that's an advantage that we have that Europe doesn't have, China doesn't have, Japan doesn't have. So for a mature country of our wealth and size, it's unbelievable that we have this advantage. This is our American muscle, and it really kicked in in 2020 and 2021. And again, if you just read the census data, you would have known that. <laughs> Keep it up, young people. Keep it up. All right. Um, I put this in here. I don't know how much value you put on this U-Haul migration trends. They just came out with it. This is like the number of U-Hauls going into certain areas, and it's kind of hard and difficult to read, I think, but... Um, number one, no surprise, Texas, people going to Texas, people going to Florida, uh, Tennessee, these are affordable places, South Carolina, Arizona, uh, Nevada, and then we see California, our beloved state, at the bottom. Maybe it's because people, maybe Californians don't use U-Haul, maybe that's why. Well, the thing is, you know, before COVID or anything happened, I talked about, you know, when people buy homes, they also move to the suburbs or somewhere cheaper. Right. Uh, so I had anticipated this to pick up uh, regardless of COVID. But what happened also is the work from home model to me is like the most exciting new variable ever, because you naturally naturally live where you near where you work or, you know, if you do a commute of 60 to 90 minutes. But this changes the landscape in the sense that some people now can move cheaper away from water right you know uh california anything near the water is extremely expensive and then you just move east gets cheaper and cheaper texas even austin seems cheap for people in california today yeah. uh so uh this isn't a surprise but the work from home model i i'm just so excited that to see this how this plays out over the next decade because if people can move into another state or another city uh, it, it gives people the incentive to buy something bigger for their family if they if they need a bigger home. Uh, so this is this is very this is very encouraging and it's it's a very uh, a unique once in a lifetime event to have such a traumatic big event like work from home happen for the housing market during the biggest housing demographic patch ever and lowest mortgage rate. So it's something everyone should keep an eye on for the next five to ten years. Well, and also something about these states is they have been more they they've been more open, more flexible. Uh, we we've always liked the the growth states because of their landlord laws, more business friendly places to be. And if you look on the migration trends on the right, the the where people are not going, those are really high tax states and very restrictive. Yeah, it, you know what? One thing about um, the more freedom you get to operate. Uh, the better it is, in, in a sense, for a certain type of investors that can actually facilitate more money into the system. So one of the things about California in terms of construction, there's a lot of red tape that goes around here, and there's a lot of legal red tape as well. Uh, uh, cities will fight to the death to prevent <laughs> homes from being built. I think uh, I, I remember in 2013 and 14, I think Austin itself built more homes in those two years than the state of California did. Right. Uh, so it, it, there are the cities and the states that we're building actually uh, benefited. The only thing is that did they build enough? And that's a lot of this is, is housing starts. Housing starts had the weakest recovery ever uh, from 2008 to 2019 because new home sales had the weakest recovery. So, the, again, the, the supply of homes of the construction is still versus the population is still very low uh, in certain areas. So you have wealthy California people going into areas that might seem expensive to the homo, uh, uh, the, the local population, but to a kind of a big state, big money seat, it's like, hey, this is really cheap. Uh, yeah. So it gives them more buying power. We saw what happened with Boise. There's a lot of people in Orange County, California, who went to Boise, and Boise still today is cheap if you're coming from uh, Southern California. So yeah, uh, a trend to see going out for many years. 
And then again, here's just uh, recent data, the, the US states with the highest overall population growth, Texas and Florida, Arizona, they so same places. Yep. Um, this is a trend, and the net trend loss. Trend. Yeah, Idaho there uh, at the top. Um, boy, I wish I'd kept my homes there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a snapshot of today's housing market. Uh, I mean, prices have been on a tear, so how yeah. long can this keep going? And, and this this chart is for the new home sales sector. It's uh, different than the existing home sales market, but this is this is one of the more troubling ones for me because the builders, they might complain about a lot of things, but they're happy right now. Why? Because they have pricing power. Uh, as total inventory falls for the existing home sales market, they have a much smaller market and they have their buyers are actually older and more wealthier. So they have pricing powers and look what happened. They did what they always do. They maximize uh, their profit margins. The builder stocks have done ex excellently well because they have pricing power. As long as rates stay low, they can, they can do this, right? Uh, when rates go up, I think in, in 2018, 5% mortgage rates didn't really budge the entire total housing market, but it, it did impact the new home sales sector. So, I, again, this has legs as long as rates stay low, but there's limits to what uh, the builders want to do because even deep down inside, they know they can't push it too much, right? Because uh, no matter what, there's no apples to apples between a new home and an existing home. Existing homes are so much cheaper uh, than a new home. They don't have all the bells and whistles. They're older. So the new home uh, right now, they have the advantage because the total inventory for existing is uh, at all-time lows. At some point in the future, when that changes, uh, they'll change with that. But for right now, boy, they're milking it as much as they can. <laughs> Again, price appreciation by Metro. We got Boise at the top. That's that this this does feel this is why people freak out. This this is almost the same slide I was looking at in 2004. <laughs> you know, I, I last year uh, when I went on Bloomberg uh, Finance and the, I was adamantly saying, listen, you have to worry about home prices overheating. Get off of this forbearance crash stuff. Uh, this is not the case. You don't realize what's happening right here. You have the best, de biggest demographics ever, lowest mortgage rates ever. Don't make it complicated, right? So with, with in total inventory under 1.52 million, the risk is overheating. So during this period, I even created a price model for myself. I said, as long as national prices only grow at 23% during this five-year per period, consider it a blessing. People go, Home prices can't go up 23%, you know? Uh, Americans don't make it. I said, no, as long as it only goes, guess what? We're already there within two years. So this is why I always talk about it. it's the most unhealthiest market we have just because the days on market are too low and total inventory levels are too low. This is not like a credit boom that we saw from 2002 to 2005. This is simply a raw shortage of product and you just have a massive amount of Americans needing somewhere to live. And that's facilitating. And as you can see, people are doing anything they can to win the bid. So you had pricing power all this long. For the last 10 years, all these housing crash people kept on saying, we're on the verge. No, look what would have happened if there was a little bit more inventory. Prices wouldn't have increased so much, but you had so much leeway. And we're so much cheaper than like Canada, New Zealand, Australia. Their rate of growth of prices, they are so much hotter than ours that people should have worried about this happening rather than prices going back to 2012 levels. Yeah, right. <laughs> really missed the boat on that one, didn't they? All right, um, but but still, it, it's affecting existing home sales, the lack of inventory. Well, you know, here's the thing. One of the things that I, I disagreed with a lot of economists in the previous expansion is whenever there's like a missed home sales, they said, oh, well, you know, it's because there's no inventory. There's nothing to buy. <laughs> well, there's nothing to buy. Guess what? We have pre-cycle highs in 2020 and 2021 when inventory is at all like all-time lows. Housing was there. The demand was not there yet. It wasn't years 2020 to 2024. We have a little bit better uh, demographic patch. But the unfortunate thing is that inventory collapsed. So inventory always falls in the fall and winter. It picks up in the spring and summer. And uh, as we can see right now, currently we're at all-time lows again. We're fresh. I this this data lags a little bit, but we are literally at fresh new all-time lows going into 2022. And yet, this is the one thing I had been worried about uh, uh, during this period, and it's happening. So as long as this is the case, I have to keep on saying it's the most unhealthiest housing market because the days on market are too low, the inventory is too low, people are fighting for homes. 
it's shelter. That's all they want. They just want somewhere to live. Uh, and we're not, we haven't had any uh, alleviation to that, uh, 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 to these numbers in 2021 or in 2022 so far. Yeah. Purchase apps. This is it. This is the, the mother chart I like to show all the time. So as you can see, the market from 2002 to 2005 looked a lot different, right? That was a credit boom. Uh, now, currently, look at us. We don't look anything like that. We're, in fact, we're not even at 2002 levels. What had happened was when you had a credit boom, uh, demand picks up because credit can leverage buying power and it can leverage people buying that don't need to buy homes, right? So I think 35% of the loans in 2006 were ARM products, exotic loan debt structure, speculation. All bubbles have speculation. We don't have that currently. As you can see here, we just had a very slow and steady trend from 2014, and I always talked about, we're not gonna get to 300 on this purchase application index until years 2020 to 2024. So right in 2020, we hit it. Okay, we had the pause in uh, demand, and then we had the V-shaped recovery. And now we're, we're hovering around this 300 level, which I think is kind of it. If we do, so, if we do get some growth, noticeable growth from these levels, I would be surprised. But again, majority of Americans who make good money, they look at that payment, they look at that low mortgage rate and they go, for buying. So it isn't a shock that more Americans bought homes with mortgages in 2020 and 2021 than any single year from 2008 to 2019. You can see the purchase application is slowly rising, household formation is slowly rising. So you go move up, move down, cash buyers, investors, and then the millennials and Gen Z together, this is what you get. So it looks perfectly normal in this sense. No credit boom, right? There's no leverage boom happening currently with housing in this data line to show you compared to what we saw in 2002 to 2005. And then in 2005, that peaked. You saw the decline in sales. You saw the increases in bankruptcies and foreclosures. It's not this market. And here we are in 2020 and 2021 talking about the opposite of what happened from kind of 2005 to 2011. And just another slide on inventory, looking yeah. looking pretty sad yeah. there. And this this if I I could do a one hour course just on this chart, and look at look at what you see here in 2014, right? And I always tell people this is the one thing I try try to emphasize. What's been happening since 2014? Total inventory levels have been falling. What's the other thing that's been happening since 2014? It's that chart before us, purchase application data. Purchase application data has been rising, right? So every year, the inventory levels start to creep down. Even in 2018, when we had 5% mortgage rates, total inventory levels didn't budge much. Why? Because the homeowner is in better position, right? They don't do panic selling, like the new 2022 grift is panic selling. These are not margin stock traders getting a margin call, you know, at 1215. These are homeowners are perfectly fine, right? So there is no panic selling here. But what happens is that they stay in their homes longer and demand picks up. And here's 2020 to 2024. So if demand picks up just a little bit, look what happens. In 2021, we started at all-time lows. And now in 2022, we're starting at all-time lows again because demand is stable. You need weakness in demand to really create higher inventory channels because <clears throat> this has been happening since 2014. It was there for everyone to read and reading is a good thing, right? So if you would have just seen this, this would have saved a lot of trouble for a lot of people that were thinking a crash was about to happen or anything. Because when you run into the best housing demographic patch ever, and you have the lowest mortgage rates ever, demand is gonna be stable. And this is what we have. And of course, the bad part is prices are escalating because total inventory levels are this low. Yeah. New home starts, I know you already talked about this, but. Yeah, and as you can see, again, we had an 82% crash in new home sales from the peak of the housing bubble. And then we also had the weakest housing starts recovery ever, which is a big was a big theme of my work for in the previous expansion. So there's no real overbuilding uh, currently going on, but we're at levels, I said 1.5 million in years 2020 to 2024, so we're there. Uh, so basically you just have to track new home sales to see how much construction. I'm actually not a construction boom person. I've never been, I don't believe mature economies have construction booms. It's been a big part of my work. So I've kind of got to levels where I thought housing starts should be, so at this point on, you just have to keep a track of monthly supply of new homes. And typically, when as long as it's below six and a half months and new home sales are growing, they will build, but they will build slow and steady. Uh, don't kind of think of a construction boom for the builders because the builders have to protect their profit margins at all costs. So they won't ever oversupply a market. Slow and steady wins this race for them. 
All right, and uh, this is uh, from Zonda of uh, new home communities. Again, very low. Yeah, so again, this is just part of this is uh, the same story as always, right? Uh, there's no, there's, there, there wasn't a construction boom. There wasn't a credit boom in the previous cycle. We just ran into a really unique once in a lifetime period in the United States of America. So a lot of data kind of trends and looks alike uh, together for housing. So you, the big question, and this is what you keep saying. So we've got this large demographic group that has savings. They've got good credit, not all of them, but yeah, many are making lots of money and a, enough of them are able to buy um, with the low rates. But, you know, we keep hearing the Fed saying they're going to raise rates. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, I know what your thoughts are, so we'll go to the next slide. Lots of people saying rates are going to go up. Yeah, but so here's what I, you say. <laughs> yeah, I have never been a mortgage rate target person. I've always been a bond market person first uh, uh, rather than a mortgage rate. And if you look at the four decade downtrend in yields, uh, bond yields have been going down, mortgage rates have been going down. So for COVID, I think a lot of so much of my work rounds were on the bond market, which I know is is very technical and geeky and I'm, I'm not supposed to I'm supposed to dumb things down but I don't like dumbing things down uh, bond market forecasts uh, 62 basis points on the 10-year yield 1.94 percent right uh, on the 10-year yield that means the high level rate range is 3.375 to 3.625 that was what it was for 2021 the same thing in 2022 if you look at economic expansions there's bond yield level ranges there's mortgage rate ranges and then the next recession, it goes lower, and we just find this range. So that 1.94% level is like sacred to me because we weren't able to break that in 2019. I made it part of the forecast in 2020. So until we close above 1.94% and have the bond market, I don't care what the Federal Reserve does. Look at what's happened. The down, the trend since 1981 has been your friend, right? Uh, and and there it is. There it is. People that have been forecasting for higher rates. All you needed was a technical uh, ba uh, um, backdrop to kind of see the trend is your friend here. So until that 1.94 happens or even closes, we're not seeing 4% mortgage rates. But even 5% mortgage rates didn't crash the market. It creates more days on the market. So me personally, that's what I want because I need to have balance. And I can't get it because I'm not even forecasting rates. So it's a frustrating uh, as, a, as, as an economist and data analyst I know what will cool the market down. I just don't think we're going to get there. So until we see above 4% mortgage rates, be skeptical of the higher rate call, no matter what the Federal Reserve does. Trend is your friend. So we really want to be, to, to sum that up, um, we want to be focusing on the 10-year. 10-year yield until it breaks over 1.94%. Just ignore any higher mortgage rate call that's been happening in the last 18 months. It just didn't happen last year and so far here's a great example we have the hottest economic data ever we have the hottest inflation data in, in many decades the 10-year yields at 1.73 today with right. the talking about tapering and rate hikes the bond market doesn't care the bond market's never cared about that trend is your friend this downtrend has been here for four decades go with it until it breaks right so even three and a quarter percent on the 10 year yield or 5% mortgage rates didn't crash the market, but it cooled things down. So you need to break over this 1.94% and you need duration on it higher. So far, has not even come close to happening. And so what would what would have it break? Well, that's the thing is that our, for some reason, the bond market sells off and there's no demand for our bonds. That has not happened for four decades. So that's why I say, keep this chart. Trend is your friend. Whatever the Federal Reserve talks about, Tapering in the previous expansion, guess what? Whenever they talked about tapering, bond yields fell, mortgage rates fell. QE1, QE2, QE3 ended, bond yields fell, mortgage rates fell. So don't put too much weight into that. Trend is your friend. I think I saw in your article uh, on Housing Wire that it, it was that there would have to be certain things in place, like all other countries would have to be recovered from COVID and get their yeah. jobs back. And it's, it's really hard for the U.S. to have its bond yields go up much higher and have Germany and Japan uh, stay negative or stay low. So uh, all global yields need to kind of work together, but especially Germany and Japan have to come up with this. We can't deviate too much from then from a certain trend. So 
uh, I can make a case. I've, I've made a case about this uh, getting above 2% and getting about to 2.42% uh, on the 10 year. Global yields all rise together. The whole world economy is doing good and bond yields rise. There's not that much appetite for bonds, but guess what? It hasn't happened, right? Even today, even with all this unbelievable inflation and high growth data and tight labor market, still under 2% on the 10 year yield. Yeah, fascinating. Okay, so I think you even said uh, that you think possibly rates will go down. Yes, yes, I'm I'm one of the uh, sub three uh, percent mortgage. Uh, I think some. I think I'm the only one. Uh, I, if you get one stock market correction, money goes into bonds, ten year yield will fall. Don't be surprised with a mortgage rate under three percent this year. Yeah, you're definitely the only one saying that. Yeah, I know. I, I, same thing happened in 2018. I was the only one saying, hey, mortgage rates are going to fall in 2019. Nobody, I mean, no one was in that camp uh, with me in 2018. Yeah, it's, it's it's fascinating, though. And of course, that would mean one thing, higher prices, right? Yeah, that's the problem. Now, I think people can understand why I was so concerned about prices accelerating in 2020 and 2021, and the same concern this year. So I don't have any slides on uh, rent growth, but you mentioned that at the beginning, and I think a lot of our audience would like to know why you think rents will continue to rise. Well, same as always, biggest housing demographic batch ever. Um, not everyone could buy a home. Uh, this was something I talked about with the Washington Post and other people uh, late last year and early, the, uh, uh, early uh, 2021 and late uh, 2020. There's not that many homes out there. So if you can't win the bid, guess what you're doing? You're not homeless, you have to rent. So mm -hmm. it goes into a secondary factor that rent inflation can pick up, especially if you're moving from an expensive city to another cheaper area and there's no homes there. You've got to mm -hmm. find somewhere to live. You're, you don't have a choice of sitting you know, in an alley for two months waiting for a home to bid. You have to live somewhere. So again, the influx of demographics coming into a low inventory area with mortgage rates low, if you don't buy the house, you're renting. So it's just, it's just a once in a lifetime event that happened. And so home prices was one thing, but the rent inflation following up is another thing. So it shouldn't shock anyone that rents are picking up as well. Now that wage growth is coming in on the bottom end, what happens when wages grow, you can increase your rent as well. That's the historical precedence. And we're seeing wage growth, especially on the low end, pick up uh, much faster than, than what it is in the middle and the high end. Yeah, so in an area like Boise, where home prices went up so much, probably from Californians going up there, uh, would is it also the same with the rent growth there? Or, uh, Every, or Any area that has very low total inventory, if there's people moving into it, it's going to create rent inflation to kick up. Um, because again, you're, you don't have enough product and you have a lot of people coming in on top of the natural population that's in a local city or county also. So that's why I think a lot of areas that had high price growth also have a uh, uh, strong rent inflation too. It's just, back to number one, simple demographics, right? We just have a lot of people that need shelter and it's just a very unique period uh, currently. So it shouldn't shock people that rents. Now the rate of growth of pricing and rents should moderate because there's limits to everything here because there's no credit boom. But again, it's just a very unique period because total inventory for housing is low. So naturally, if you can't buy a house, you have to rent right away. So you just have an influx of people, especially if they're coming out of uh, kind of uh, wealthier, uh, high population states into a, a smaller state as well. I don't know if you can speak to um, multifamily, but I was just on a panel at the IMN uh, multifamily conference in Santa Monica and the opening panel is a lot of heavy hitter, big big portfolio guys. and uh, And they all, every single one of them, was feeling like they it was at the top that that people need to be, that cap rates are just so low they couldn't go much lower um and they seemed nervous about buying any more multifamily not not the same with single family but multifamily what are your thoughts on that well, because if there's a need for rent you know the thing is that multifamily construction compared to single family is never that big you know single families shows this growth uh, multifamily construction has picked up it really depends on where you're building. Um, uh, I, I think the areas that supply a lot of uh, elderly Americans that are already sheltered in, 
maybe those those areas doesn't it's there's not that much growth because you know in places where there's very low unemployment like nebraska's like one percent unemployment rate that's not a healthy thing that means you don't have enough labor uh yeah. the areas where uh you see young people coming in is where you want to build right again because you don't have enough uh shelter but with cap rates i mean i everybody is worried about cap rates every year so that's that's nothing new new but uh, it is it is interesting because the dynamics of housing is so unique in this two year period. It's such a hot sector in terms of price and cost and everything. Everyone's trying to make sense of it, but we really just have to follow where people are going and check where the local inventory situation is. Was there enough construction in multifamily? I know here in Irvine, where I live, they're building apartments, lots of it. You know. Yeah. Uh, and because it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a growth city in terms of jobs. So look at the job market, look at the demographics of it. Are young people coming in? But areas that don't have a lot of young uh, people or young prime age labor force, to, that that would be a questionable place uh, if you don't see that growth, that migration into those areas. All right. Do you have time for questions? Yes. You do. Oh my gosh, you're so sweet. Thank you for being retired. <laughs> Oh, well, the first comment is, I think I have a little crush on Logan and wonder if it's the jacket. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a 1970s jacket. So in respect to all my baby boomer friends who have, are housing crash addicts, mortgage rates were about over 10% when this jacket was in style. So much love for you guys, but no, mortgage rates are at all time. Lows. <laughs> Thank you for wearing it. It's perfect. Um, somebody said that there were cities missing on the U-Haul migration trends. I just took the top 20 and the low 20 and I left out the middle. So sorry about that. That's why it wasn't on there. Um, someone just said, I'm moving to Nevada. <laughs> um, do you have a website and contact email? I mean, I know you've got lots of blogs and inform amazing information on Housing Wire. So Housing Wire, HW Plus has all my work contracted and it's paywalled. But if you go to my blog, loganmotoshami.com, uh, uh, we do a we do a weekly podcast with Sarah Wheeler and myself called The Rundown. Every Monday, I will talk about every geeky, nerdy thing about housing and economics. But in my blog, you can go in there. There's links to a Logan VIP 50 code. If you wanted to go read the housing wire work, which is a lot of the data analog work that I do, I don't write for anyone else or do anything else but for housing wire. Uh, you could use that code to sign up for HW Plus and all the stuff is there. All the historical data work is there, especially from 2020 to 2021. And we do a weekly podcast every Monday uh, uh, on housing wire. You could, you could see my take. Uh, on what the current data is. And again, my job as an analyst is to show you the pathway, right? Uh, um, economic cycles are my primary work. Housing is actually a secondary, but I'm gonna show you the pathway to get to this place, right? So we go through every nerdy thing because economics done right should be terribly boring, but I try to make it as entertaining as possible so people can engage themselves and stay away from the crazy people on YouTube, right? That didn't work out well over the last few years. Yeah, don't don't get your advice there. Um, do you have a forecast for appreciation in 2022? Yes, the national forecast, uh, 22 forecast, which you can find in HW Plus, uh, 5.2 to 6.7 percent, based on where mortgage rates uh, uh, should be in. Uh, the rate of growth of pricing is cooling. Uh, back in April of 2020, I wrote an article for my blog saying home price growth will cool down. The rate of growth, because there's no credit boom, the rate of growth will cool. Case Shiller lags a few months. So like in October of 2020, I said, hey, real home prices are taking off. Everyone uh, watch out. Here it comes. It's, it's a similar thing. The rate of growth is cooling, but it's still above my nominal 4.6% every year. That would make me comfortable uh, level out there. And then also I show the models why and, and what, what I think would be the case. But there's a lot of geeky, nerdy stuff stuff on a, a Housing Wire Plus if you uh, anybody wanted to it's, look at it. It's great and it's not very expensive. Um, Let's see, impact of inflation and yes. digital day. So uh, the history of inflation with global pandemics is that one to two years, you see inflationary data take off. Now, the reason that I was concerned about home prices, it's, it's different than what the uh, core inflation data that we're seeing. We see oil prices rise. If you go back to 2008, December of 2008, the base effects of inflation on a recovery is really hot just because of oil prices. It should moderate in time. Um, 
whenever the world starts functioning normal and we can get these kind of supply chains, I don't believe in this fast growth America economic premise because population growth is slowing. So things should calm down, but this is also based on everybody having a normal life again. So until that occurs, there's gonna be some dislocation, but I think the rate of growth of inflation on some of these things will cool down. Housing is specifically demographic related. Uh, that would have happened without COVID. Uh, some of these other things are just basically, to, to be honest, there's, a, there's always a big rebound in oil prices on every recovery and car chips are very hard to get. So those, some of those things will moderate on their own, uh, but inflation in a sense, it really showed how lucky and fortunate all those Americans were buying homes in the last eight, nine years. Because why? They have a fixed low debt payment as their yeah. wages rises. And now you can see they they have the best financial profiles in our history. Yeah, absolutely. It's They're very, very lucky. Um, okay. Uh, comments on institutional buying. Should we be worried about all these hedge funds gobbling everything up? Nope. It's an overblown story. It's always been an overblown story. I mean, I, one of the things that's funny, this is not the first time I heard this. Uh, uh, people have said it's all Wall Street buying. There is no Wall Street moat around housing. There never was. I think they purchased like 200,000 homes out of like 40 million uh, from 2011 to 2017. So there are some institutional buyers, but it, we've always had institutional buyers. And majority of investor buyers is actually mom and pops. They're not Wall Street. Right, that's always been the case. I just think this story gets overhyped because the media likes, to, oh, it's Wall Street, it's those evil landlords or whatever. Let me tell you something, if you're not blaming millennials for home prices in, uh, increasing, you're doing it wrong because they are the majority of the buyers. As a percentage of buyers, they are. It's their fault, those pesky kids, like those <laughs> Scooby-Doo endings, you know? They're the ones who should get all the hate, not BlackRock or, you know, so they're not areas- the <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are areas uh, where you see, uh, of course, Phoenix has a lot of, but let, let me give you some perspective. So many people make a big deal about iBuyers. iBuyers do not even make 1% of total home sales, right? And when Zillow had to unload their 7,000 homes, people say, oh, Zillow's unloading. What? Come on. Perspective, people, right? Uh, there is no Wall Street moat. When mortgage demand fades, so does housing. That's how it's always worked since the Peloponnesian War, right? There's no, there's no, there's no Wall Street's going to buy everything. That doesn't work. So I almost think that people think housing's like invincible because of institutional buyers. No, mortgage demand fades, home sales fades, inventory increases. Uh, investors don't make up that difference. They're the, they're the marginal buyer out of compared to the to primary buyer. Uh, okay, another question about rates. We were talking to. When you were talking about rates, we were really talking about the prime. Uh, if you're buying your primary, uh, what do you think about rates going up for in investor loans? Uh, well, you know what? There's actually a fee increase that just happened yesterday from FHFA. They're going to come out in April, I think. So for secondary homes, there's going to be an increase uh, uh, for that. Again, uh, there's always investor homes always have a higher mortgage rate anyway than primary residents. So unless you're buying a second home uh, uh, out there, so Rates will always move together, either primary or secondary. It's just that secondary homes are always going to be priced higher. Uh, again, uh, always focus on that 10-year yield, right? That 1.94% that I've been talking about since 2019, it is like a god to me right now. So until we break that, don't think above 4% mortgage rates. And there's a lot of articles on Housing Wire that I've written about this subject where I show you the charts on why, why won't rates rise when QE ends. I think there, that's the big uh, miscommunication over the last 10 years. A lot of people thought when QE1 or 2 or 3 ends, mortgage rates have to skyrocket. It's actually fallen every time that's happened. And I try to explain the market dynamics of that uh, so people can understand that why are mortgage rates so low. And I am very sympathetic to certain people that they see this hot economic growth, they see this hot inflation growth, and <laughs> mortgage rates are like 3 and a quarter percent too. So it just it must drive some people crazy that the same people that thought housing was going to crash, that this isn't happening. <laughs> Are there any new emerging markets that uh, we want to know about before everybody else knows about it? Uh, you know what? Outside of the U.S., not my thing. Uh, so No, no, I, 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 emerging like U.S. markets. Like, uh, I mean, I, my answer to that would be probably just the suburbs of any big cities, but um, are there any areas that are growing faster than others? You know, I've always kept an eye on Utah because mm -hmm. Utah has a lot of young people. 
right? Yeah. California has a lot of young people too. So does Texas, uh, uh, sort of parts of, of, of Washington. But Utah has a lot of young people and areas that have a lot of young people or areas where you see young people moving to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is the problem is that a lot of these areas never really built for this migration. So it just increases the prices. So that's the frustrating part for me. It's like migration gray. Oh my God, these areas are getting hit. And you, we saw that in Boise, right? Montana is the same way, right? You know, Montana's uh, home prices are, 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 are going up the roof too. So uh, there are areas and, and my fear is that, well, people move it and they go, hey, this is really cheap. I'll, I'll overbid or I'll, I'll put in an extra 100,000 out there. So uh, it, 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 the irony is that the worst fear I had for housing, it's a first world problem, by the way, is happening. Home prices are accelerating above my trends. So, and part of that is this new migration to areas that have uh, uh, not a lot of construction because they didn't have the population growth and they're yeah. getting an influx of people. So uh, keep an eye on Utah. I know parts of Utah uh, ha have gone up a lot, but uh, uh, there are probably areas there that haven't increased as much uh, and they, that yeah. has the potential. Well, absolutely. We, when we we have a, a subdivision we're building in in uh, just outside of Bozeman, Montana, and when we first presented that to our investors, they're like, why Montana? And basically, our partner said because nobody else is there. You know, there's no other builders and there's a college, um, so that ended up being a good call, right? Because there's there's just no competition and and it's cheap. We originally were going to sell the homes for three or four hundred thousand, and it's it's gone way up from there. So okay, supply chain issues. Um, when will that resolve? Probably toward the end of this year after this, I mean, hopefully there's no more variants. There's parts of the world that just operate differently. Um, remember this though, the builders complain about this a lot and yet they keep on increasing prices because they have pricing power. Uh, so uh, the supply chain issues, again, the history of pandemics has always been one to two years that you have inflationary data because of the shortages of goods. Also, there's the US demand. <laughs> the, US, the US had the greatest economic recovery uh, ever in history. And uh, if you had housing wire, you could have followed our recovery model back on April 7th. But uh, uh, the demand just inflowed and the, dur the goods purchasing, the durable goods purchasing in this country is, was, was epic. You could see it in the retail sales data. But all things moderate to a proper trend and really this is the second year of the kind of the pandemic. Usually the third year things really calm down. So for the end of 2022, maybe early 23, things will be somewhat back to normal. And when they do, the question is, it, how much of a deflationary effect is that, that we built out all this CapEx for this surge in demand or this shortage and really didn't need that too much. So that's, that's, that's more of an end of a 2022, 2023 storyline. Okay, well, we're out of questions, so I'll ask one final one. Um, if you were investing or building your portfolio today, what would you be doing? Um, my personal self, I had like 60% of my investment into Viacom stock, so, and I publicly made that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, I, uh, I, 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 I have a real estate property. Um, I am the worst person in making money in real estate. I have never, I haven't charged rent, higher rent in eight years, and I haven't actually collected rent from my tenants since the. <laughs> oh, I am not the real estate investing guy in terms of making money. That's that's great. Okay, good to know. All right, Logan, thank you so much for joining us here. I, I, it was just you answered every question so quickly. It's like you, I know you're retired, but you really don't seem retired. You're really into this stuff. Yeah. Are this All just your? It, it's just the fun, the fun stuff. All right. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. I think you've really helped a lot of people make some good decisions for 2022. My pleasure. All right. Take care. Thank you everyone for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Bye.